Thank you, Greg. And it's a delight to be here. As a trustee, we serve on different committees. And um, one of my committees is the grad school. So I get to hear on a regular basis about all the good things that are happening in the grad school. And um, we're so excited for the future of what um, the grad school will bring to the kingdom of God. So let's just pray for a minute. Um, Lord Jesus, we, um, we pray that you would guide this talk, guide what um, people would hear, Lord, and that you would um, allow us to be the greatest witnesses for the truth of, um, of your good news. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So my sister, Terry, had just celebrated the birth of her youngest grandchild, um, and she was very excited. She traveled from Cleveland to Dallas, where this baby was born. And she was just with that baby for a week, and she was getting on a plane to go home. And she had a seat in the very back of um, a, a full airplane uh, next to the window. And she had to climb over a guy that was sitting in the middle seat reading his Bible. And because she was in such a good mood, she's generally more of an introvert, she, um, she asked this young man that I'll call George if, um, if he was in seminary or, you know, what, what was his, you know, motivation to read the Bible. And he said, and this is before the plane has even taken off, and he said, uh, I'm not in seminary. He said, um, I work in a sawmill, but he said, the Bible is very important to me. And then he said, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And she's like, whoa, that was, that was a quick transition. And, um, and he didn't wait for her to answer. He basically said, and when you pray, do you pray with tears and great anguish? Because if you don't pray like that, you're not saved and you're going to hell when you die. And she's thinking, where's the call button? Can I, can I get a change of seats here? And, and yet she was stuck. And so as this plane took off and through the noise of the engine sitting in the back of the plane, he starts paging through his Bible, proving all that he had just said to her. And he's so excited, you know, he's spitting, you know, from his excitement. And he's not letting her have a word in, um, in this monologue. And after about 20 minutes of this, she's very patient and tolerant, but finally, she said, stop. Don't tell me what to believe. And, uh, and, I, and I'm on a journey of discovering who God is, and I will not let you ruin that. This young man looked at her with shock. Tears welled in his eyes. And he put his head on the tray table, and he started to sob. And he stayed like that for maybe like 30 minutes. And my sister is like, what do I do now? You know, I, <laughs> I wasn't looking for this on my way home from a really good trip. So finally, he, um, he sits up. And she's like, no eye contact, no eye contact. You know, it was a two-hour flight. And um, finally, the, the plane landed. And when she was trying to get her luggage down from the overhead bin, he gave her a half-hearted apology, and he said, you know, I'm sorry that we don't agree upon um, the Bible and Jesus. And she grabbed her luggage, and she was speed walking up the jetway, trying to distance herself from this young man. Now, I would not call this encounter good news for either my sister or this young man, George, um, besides his his you know, misguided theology of prayer, he, um, he was a little disoriented from what happened, and so was she. And so what we're going to talk about today is, um, is, is witnessing. And, um, and I would ask the question of you, would you say this young man was a good witness for Jesus? My sister would have said no. 
And, and I would have to agree with her. So they were, we are going to um, look at Acts 1, verses 6 to 8. And uh, D D Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, your life as a believer should make a non-believer question his or her disbelief in God. Does our witness make a non-believer question his or her belief in God? So this, this passage, I believe, um, really begins right after verses, five, verses 1 through 5, which is really the second volume of, um, of Luke, um, who is a doctor, that is um, just finishing a, a writing all about Jesus, you know, his teachings and his, his, um, his deeds. And now it's on to another volume that describes what happened as Jesus was resurrected and, um, and the early um, apostles witness to, um, to an increasing expanded um, territory that, um, that is um, described in verse eight. So there's, there's three main points that I think that this small passage has that are powerful to make. And, and the first is this, that there will be restoration of God's kingdom. In these first five verses, it says that um, in the 40 days after Jesus was resurrected, he, he was talking to his, his apostles a lot about the kingdom of God. And so that made them curious to know whether Jesus was going to restore the kingdom, and they were misunderstanding potentially what the kingdom meant. I think that they were hoping that it was the physical kingdom that was um, going to be uh, allowed to be uh, removed from foreign domination. And um, many scholars believe that, that the Jews really thought that that's what Jesus was talking about. So what do we now believe Jesus was talking about when he talked about restoration? And this is something that I want you to see the, the slide up on the screen. And this is kind of the Bible meta narrative that, um, that we talk about um, now and today, especially when we do share our testimony with other people. And that is, is that God created a, um, a wonderful world, um, creation, fall, man sinned and uh, rebelled against God. And, um, and then redemption, which is Jesus redeemed this world. He forgave our sins. He died for them. And he conquered death. And that that leads to restoration of the beautiful world that, that God created. So this is something that I would ask ourselves, do we know this narrative, meta-narrative, well enough that we can share it with other people? Because this is a an important part about being a witness to Jesus. But the second thing that, um, that I will say is the main point of this passage is that you will receive power from the Holy Spirit. And he was telling this to his disciples, these are Jesus' words, when, um, that, that it will come upon his, his followers, um, the apostles especially. Jesus made it clear that um, toward the end of his life, in the first chapter um, of Acts as, as well, that um, the apostles were to accomplish as witnesses um, of Jesus would be done through the Holy Spirit. Okay, so, so he, was, he was telling them that the Holy Spirit was going to precede their witness and that they should wait for it. So my question is, is do, do we believe the importance of the Holy Spirit in our witness? I, I have to say sometimes that I forget that it's the Holy Spirit that, that is the one that's doing the work of, um, of spreading the good news and drawing people to Jesus. And then finally, he, he says in, chapter, in verse 8, you will be my witnesses of Jesus. 
he, you know, that was who we're witnessing for near and far. So the books of Acts could be summed up in this one verse because the rest of Acts is all about what it looked like in that period of time for, um, for the apostles and, the, and his disciples, Jesus' disciples, to, um, to be a witness in that um, first century AD. Now, witnesses is an important word that we see all the way throughout Acts. Here's another example. Acts 2.32, where we read, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses to that fact. 3.15, you killed the author of life, but raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. Acts 5.32, we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And then in Luke, again, the same author as Acts, 24, 46 to 48, when Jesus said that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of these things. So my question is, what does it look like to be a witness? Miriam Webster's definition as a noun, is one that gives evidence, one who has personal knowledge of something, an attestation of a fact or an event, public affirmation of word or example of usually religious faith or conviction. As a verb, it means to testify, to um, attest, to have personal or direct cognizance of, to see for oneself. Some synonyms, <laughs> synonyms um, confirmation, corroboration, documentation, evidence, proof, substantiation, testimony, validation. So I want to ask us, how are we doing at being a witness? Is our witness compelling? Does the evidence, that's us, point people to Jesus? And in our increasing secular culture, I believe Christ followers are sometimes stifled by a lack of good direction on how to live out being a witness for Jesus. Jesus modeled a relational, conversational way of living and sharing the good news of the gospel that we don't highlight much anymore um, as, as a church at, at large. Um, more so, though, when we go overseas as missionaries. But I believe that many, many Christians have a desire for their friends and their families and their um, neighbors and those that they work with to, um, to share the good news about Jesus, but they're at a loss on how to do it in a way that doesn't feel awkward or intrusive that, um, that they um, are, are looking for something that feels much more natural and, and authentic and conversational rather than confrontational and much more reflective of the good news about Jesus forgiving us our sins and uh, allowing us to be God's children. So I know we've all seen personal glimpses of when that works well and, um, and how when, when we are more comfortable and natural, that people are drawn to Jesus. And we know that it is the Holy Spirit that is drawing people to Jesus. We know that from John 6, 44, where Jesus himself tells us that um, no one can come to me unless the Father draws them. So it is the Spirit of God that's doing the heavy lifting. Now, there's a study recently that, um, that tells us how we can go from awkward to authentic and intrusive to, um, to natural. And uh, the study is called um, Spiritual Conversations in a Digital Age, and it was written and published by Barna uh, in conjunction with Lutheran Our Ministries. 
The goal of this study was to get a sense of how Americans talk with each other about matters of faith. And, and one of the indicators is what, what are the number of conversations that Christians are having on an annual basis? And you'll see from this slide that three out of four Christians have fewer than 10 spiritual conversations during the past year, and this was written about three years ago, that, that they called those people reluctant conversationalists, and that only one out of four that they called eager conversationalists had more than 10 conversations a year. Nearly half of all of the Christians in this survey said that they, if it meant that, um, that they would potentially be rejected by a friend, that um, half of them would avoid a spiritual conversation and risk losing that friend. So why don't we have spiritual conversations more often? I'm sure that if I got a flip chart up here and took you know, a poll from each of you, you'd have a different reason. But here is the reason that most Christians said was the reason that they don't have more spiritual conversations, conversations about God and Jesus. The number one reason is religious conversations always seem to create tension and arguments. They also pulled people that weren't Christians and they asked them why they don't want to have spiritual conversations. And the number one reason is they said they're not religious and they don't care about these kinds of things. And yet, one third of all the adults that they, they interviewed that were not Christians um, or, or are now Christians say that they had made a big change in their life because of a conversation about faith. One in three Christians say someone has come to believe in Jesus after they shared about their faith in him. Nine out of 10 people who experienced a big life change say the conversation was with someone that they knew well or very well. So these were not strangers presenting the gospel. These were relationships. Seven out of 10 people say that the life change was a result of multiple conversations with one person or more than one person, 27%, um, with one person, 42%. And 73% of these conversations happened in person. Now, this was pre-pandemic. I, I wonder if that, that number has changed, uh, given what we've just been through with um, two years of a pandemic. But can you imagine what would happen if 100% of Christians were eager conversationalists, uh, having spiritual conversations in their everyday life, maybe even one a day? And that meant that 365 days a year, we were having, as Christians, spiritual conversations with a person that, does, that believes differently than we do. Can you imagine the impact that that would have on our world? So the question you're probably asking, what will it take to transition the reluctant conversationalists to be more like the eager conversationalists? What I want to examine now is what did they see in the eager conversationalists that they didn't see in the reluctant conversationalists, because this is important. And, and here are the five characteristics they saw in these people. Number one, belief in Jesus alone as, as the source of salvation, that their sins are forgiven through the death and resurrection of Jesus, and they've accepted the free gift of grace and they trust Jesus. Number two, the sense of personal responsibility, knowing that they want to share their faith and, um, and obey Jesus um, to make disciples. That's you know, Matthew 28, uh, the Great Commission. Number three, good spiritual practices. Faith is important to living, to, um, to daily life, 
So reading the Bible, having a quiet time, listening to the Holy Spirit and um, communing with God are all aspects of spiritual practices that would help somebody lay the groundwork foundation to be able to be a, a good witness for the gospel. Number four, the intentionality and the readiness that people were ready, willing, and able to um, see opportunities for sharing their faith. And number five, that they have confidence coupled with positive experiences. They feel qualified to share their faith. They report laughing during a spiritual conversation, which means that they are, are not stressed or anxious. They're having a good time talking about the joy of, um, of knowing Christ and, um, and sharing what the Holy Spirit is really moving through them to, um, to communicate to that person that he's put in your path. And um, that the, these people are glad they shared their faith. They felt joy in the process. So then you ask the question, and I will ask you, what does it take you know, to, um, to transition these, these folks? And I, I want to spend the rest of our time on these last two characteristics, because it's these last two characteristics that really are, um, are, are the, the blockage. Um, the, um, the fruits of the Spirit are really going to be produced by these first three. And, um, and from there, the practices are really what, what matters. So. I was the, the head of an organization called Q-Place, as, as Greg mentioned. And, um, and in that capacity, what we found is that we were mobilizing people to have spiritual conversations, and they weren't having them. And so what we realized is that we needed something that, um, that would equip them. And what we did is we started looking at the life of Jesus. And in looking at the life of Jesus, we saw that there were about nine practices. I'm sure there's more. But, um, but in looking at the life of Jesus, we saw that he did things that were beyond just sharing the good news, that he noticed, that he listened, that he, he, um, he prayed, he asked questions, he showed love, he, um, he welcomed people. And, um, and, and I want you to see this um, slide that we'll put up. And, um, and these are the nine practices that are described in the book that you've been given. Now, these first three that you see up there, I call those um, getting ready. Extroverts and introverts alike like these because they don't require any talking on your part. But, um, but you see, Jesus noticed Zacchaeus up in a tree. He prayed for, for people before he started talking to them about God. He, um, he listened. He asked more than 300 questions in the Gospels that we see. He, um, he did share. He did share who he was, um, the Son of God. He shared God's story, and he listened to other people's stories. And so when we start to see the mosaic of how we can, through learning some of these skills and practicing some of these skills, we can get better at, um, at witnessing to others, we, um, we can see a big difference in how that happens. We are witnesses of Jesus. And what, um, what, what I'd like to encourage you to do is to, to look at the, the practices and see the, the specifics of how Jesus did that. But um, I'm going to play the movie um, again on this opening um, airplane scene with my sister and this man named George. What if, instead of the scenario that I painted, what if when my sister sat down in the seat and she asked the question of this young man about the Bible, he briefly answered his interest in the Bible, but he turned the question back to her and say, tell me what your interest in the Bible is. If he had done that, he would learn that she grew up in a church that, um, that preached the, the Bible, but, um, but did not encourage individual members of the church to read the Bible. And so as a result, 
she, um, she hadn't read the Bible, and, um, and she was recently very interested in it. I had given her a, a one-year Bible, and she was fascinated, and she had lots and lots of questions. And so when she answered, she would have told this young man her interest in the Bible. And had he, had he prayed, Lord, give me the right responses and the right questions to interact with this person that I know was made in your image, and, um, and to, to show gentleness and kindness toward her, he would have seen a different response from her totally. And what you would have seen is, um, is basically a, um, an interaction that might have been give and take, and they might have talked about different parts of the Bible. And he would have um, shown love to her in ways that she could receive. And they might have talked the entire trip, and uh, at the end, both of them thinking that that was good news. That, um, that they were drawn just a little bit closer in their journey toward Jesus. And so I would encourage you all to, um, to study these practices of Jesus and, uh, and that when we do, uh, we are going to be better witnesses to Jesus and his good news. So let's follow his example and let's pray. And Lord, these are your words given through the um, Apostle John in Revelations 1-5 that, um, that I would like to pray over um, everybody that's here today and those that are listening online, where John says, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, from the sevenfold spirit before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead, and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to you, Jesus, who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding your blood for us. You have made us a kingdom of priests for God, your Father. All glory and power to you forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.